Oh, yeah. Hello, everybody. And I'd like to welcome Mog back to do another show with me today. Um, it's a very hot day today, so I'm it's all a bit sweaty everywhere. Um, nearly 40 degrees, supposedly coming. Ra is shining down on us. But we wanted to talk about Foth. I've got a Foth there. I don't know if you can see it. Um, some people call him Toph. Some people call him Jehuti. Mog, what's your favourite name for this god? Well, like you, really, it could be Thoth or Jehuti, I suppose. Thoth is a sort of classical thing. So, yeah, probably, yeah, because of the, our background, uh, probably from Crowley and uh, Western Hermetic tradition tends to be Thoth, which is uh, authentic. I don't, I don't think anybody really knows where that, where that, um, where that version of it comes from. I didn't uh, think anyone knew. I was going to ask you. It's a bit. Its origins are a bit obscure, like the guy said. But I, I think it, you can sort of make Jehuti into into Thoth. Like I can sort of just about see it. It's the, the, the same word with sort of slightly. I don't know. Uh, different, you know, different ethnic group or different group of people just saying it in a different way. I reckon that's what it is. But yeah, let's stick with Thoth and. That'll be all right by me. Because <laughs> I recently, I, I listen to your podcast on your YouTube channel um, all the time, and you talked about Foth in one of them and his beginnings. See, I always thought um, we didn't know Foth's beginnings, but I quite like the idea of what one you were saying about. I don't know if you would like to reiterate it here about Horus and Seth. Yeah. And how they created Foth. How did, that story, how they created Seth. I mean, I was looking at some stuff that is, is, is a really, really old deity. You know, I mean, that's a difficult thing to say in it because when you're talking about Egypt, they're all kind of a bit old. <laughs> you know, something that's two and two, two thousand years. So I don't know if people can really, it takes a while to get your head around the kind of different uh, stratas of time and everything. But, uh, but there's a time, isn't it? There's a, what for the Egyptians is a prehistoric time before even Egypt was even a kind of thought of. And apparently there are some sort of traces of him from, from that. And, or at least there's a, there's a place called, uh, which, is rather, which I've never been to, but there's an archeological site called Hierakonpolis, which is like one of the really oldest spots in Egypt. There are two kind of real old, well, there are loads of old things, but there are two special ones that they know about in Upper Egypt because the people in both seem to kind of be in competition with each other. Um, this is like Monopoly or something. They're sort of playing this game of Monopoly before Egypt have been thought of, trying to accumulate more money and uh, or wealth in whatever it was, it wouldn't be money, and maybe warriors and stuff like that, and all just trying to outdo each other and getting taken over. And so Hierakonpolis is the is the um, is a very very old settlement. I, I think it might be getting flooded now. I'm not sure, but and it means the citadel of the hawk. So it's a very old thing connected with the cult of the god Horus. But apparently, even there, at this very very old site, there there's some sort of um, shrine to the god Thoth. Uh, and that's the old, I think that's the oldest thing that I've ever found. So that's pretty old. That would be, I mean, that could be, um, that could be about 5,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. right? So that's when it starts, but that's not written, quite written records, but sort of very early sort of pictograms and images and stuff. So that's, that's quite a long time ago, maybe even more, maybe 6,000 years ago. Uh, the first reference to Thoth. And that's the same with um, with Horus and with Set. So the three of them, really. There are some other ones as well, but those three are kind of pretty ancient, really. And they've got this, this act, you know, between them, uh, which is what I, I, what I must have mentioned then. Yeah, it comes up. The strange... Um, the strange, strange incident of his birth. I mean, obviously, lots of different accounts. There's, there's in Egypt. I don't think there's ever one kind of biblical, if you like, canonical kind of version of anything. You know, it's mm -hmm. not their way, really. They 
kind mm. of subject. There's a, you always find a counter example. But, the, but I think this myth is, is quite important. So you've got this kind of, uh, if you want me to go through that, it, this uh, conflict between these two brothers, Horus and Set, who were at that point, 6,000 years ago, are kind of very connected with the moon, right? With uh, the ebbing and waxing and waning of the moon as well. That's one way of looking at there. You could sort of personify that as two lunar gods kind of fighting each other and, you know, one bit knocks a bit off the other and they kind of wax and they wane. Uh, and Thoth, of course, is a very important uh, lunar deity. But anyway, so there's all sorts of incidents, some of which are in mythology and some of which are in a kind of... Uh, the thing that the people say you wouldn't count as mythology is almost like uh, storytelling. I don't know if we want to make the difference, but there's, st there's a storytelling tradition which is very, very important in Egypt. Uh, and maybe not as, as pucker as the stuff that gets on the temple walls and everything, but it, it's obviously what people really believe. It's a good insight. And so th this kind of perennial battle between Horus and Set that takes place all over the place there's loads of different stories connected with that. And before they actually start fighting each other, they kind of, the like two brothers who keep arguing with each other about things or trying to get one over on each other. And literally, you know, in the old sense, because this is the weird thing that people find difficult to get their head around is that there's got this sexual component to it. I think I might have mentioned, you know, I think the professor here at Oxford, he said, it's the oldest gay chat, chat up line in history. Uh, you know, so if, which is, I mean, he's the expert. He should know about these things. But he does his sort of uh, his his line, really. I mean, I don't know what people say. People say, oh, well, and basically, Seth decides, you know, to chat Horus up right one evening when they're kind of when the weather's hot and they're kind of feeling, he, he's drunk too much and everything. <laughs> he decides that he fancies him and the. You know, and he propositions him and everything, and he keeps doing that. And the Horus doesn't want to do it at first. The reason why the professor said it's the oldest gay chat up line is probably like there's another version of this myth as well. There's one version which Horus is playing, doesn't want to, right? He's playing hard to get, oh, you know, how dare you suggest such a thing? You know, I'm a, I'm a red blooded man and all this sort of whatever it is. Uh, how dare you? And goes to his mother <laughs> and says, Mama, you know, you know, goes to Isis, his mother, and he says, "Is the, the the set is keeps trying to get one over on him. He's, he's trying to proposition him, and you know, he doesn't want to know what to do about it." And so uh, 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 Isis comes up, who's quite cunning, with this weird piece of sexual magic. Basically, there's no other way of looking at it. It is actually very connected with the tradition in Western uh, magic of the sexual magic. One way or another, there's all sorts of thing, weird sort of things that they do, but but basically she says to him, "Well, whatever you do, don't let him actually do anything. You know, uh, you've got to trick him in some way, and and what you're going to do is, as various versions of this, I don't know, not to be too indelicate, uh, but it's probably all right. So so basically." Horus ends up with a handful of sets semen, right? One, one way or another. And Set doesn't know this. Set thinks he's just gone to sleep or something. He's just think, ah, oh, well, I got him, you see. Because it's a power thing. But people say it's a kind of power thing between men in a way, for one to have like a public school thing almost, have sex with the other. It's like, it's not a very nice way of looking at it, but. People said, oh, it's like that. He's just trying to kind of dominate him. He wants to dominate him in some ways. Whereas in other accounts, it's not like that. It's much more uh, emotional, really, the connection between. But whatever, it depends who's writing about it. But one way or another, Horus ends up with this handful of Set's semen. And Set doesn't know this. So she says, right, get, get, give me that. She says, well, now what you're going to do is you're going to go into his garden and you're going to, you're going to find this, his favourite food, which is the, happens to be, sounds innocuous, a lettuce, right? And you're going to kind of clean your hands on the lettuce and everything like that. And he'll never know, right? He won't know, right? 
I mean, it's a bit like spitting in someone's food or something like that, essentially. Anyway, but one thing needs to the set eats the, his, comes and have a snack and eats one of his lettuces. Which is, of course, it's funny, if you link to the lettuce, it has also, probably in the ancient world, it had, obviously it's got this sort of white sappy type stuff, isn't, isn't it? So, it's very, so you can see why they might associate it with that and certain gods eat that. So... Set eats it, and but he doesn't notice, right? Being a kind of crude fellow that he is, supposedly, he doesn't even notice. So, anyway, the next day, Thoth, Thoth, um, Ivor Thoth says it's Thoth is, tells him this story, but also he takes a part in it. But he's because he hasn't actually been born there, but whatever he or it might be Isis, he says, All the gods get together, right? And Sets basically boasting, saying, I, you know, that's what I mean. Horus can't really be the king because I'm stronger than he, the, and, and, and I fooled him. And they said, what, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, and they tell tells him what, what he's done. I've had sex with, with, uh, with Horus and everything, and Horus denies it. He said, no, no, no. So they decide that, uh, all right, they're going to do this magical spell. So they do a magical spell, which is there in the text, and basically, the, the, as is in mythology, the, the semen, which is inside someone's body, is going to call out and it's going to appear, it's going to manifest itself in some way. Uh, and of course, it manifests in Set's forehead, in his third eye, as a, a, a rising moon, as the moon. And that is born from his head, is the god Thoth. So, and there are other accounts where it's another god as well. But so Sos parents, Sos parent, mother and father is set in a way. Which this is weird, is a weird that story. Set has given birth, set has given birth from like in the other bits of mythology from his own head or from his third eye. He's given birth to the moon god. Uh, and people just in Egyptian storytelling and myth, that's completely accepted. There's no shame or anything attached to anybody for that obviously Horace says yeah you know i've got one over on you uh, so that is that's the very interesting and that story is incredibly important uh, but also with the third eye mythology one way or another yeah, yeah. it's got so many different different elements to it that are kind of uh, in magic that you, you just keep thinking about and thinking about it and, and also the whole I was just thinking today about, you see, some people will argue, they used to argue, oh, the homosexual, the fact that Set is gay or uh, is, is homosexual, is gay, is queer, whatever, is a sign that he's evil. Right? Um, because that's, this is not regular stuff, is it? This yes. is outside of, you can see that would be a kind of old fashioned point of view, or this is outside the normal pattern of behaviour because nobody accepts that anymore and I don't think the Egyptians accepted it either. Well originally uh, but, he was married to Nephis wasn't he? The, yeah <laughs> well there's, there's that possible that's right he's married to all sorts of people that's that's that, probably that's one of the reasons about this is with Set. Mm. he's very connected with sexuality and it doesn't really is every all sexuality not necessarily to do with the uh, conventional procreative stuff uh, which he doesn't really do very much of uh, if at all depending on but with just with sexuality just for sex just for the for the pleasure which again is some for the more moralistic people which you would have maybe found in the later times certainly in the greek or greek and roman times that's a sign of being a bit bad right if you're into because it's like it's a bit, a bit like it is the roots of Christianity. Well, they're saying, "Oh, sex is for procreation, really, not for fun. You're not supposed to do it just for fun." And of course, Egyptians are very into that, right? In their in their high culture, and and sex was a personification of that sort of thing. You know, so any any form of sexuality would be his thing but then other people say well that's why he's kind of bad so some people find that bad and some people think well that's not bad at all really <laughs> it's quite good anyway so that's thought so you've got two so you've got Horus and Set who are the, the, the people we're talking about right at the beginning are both 
lunar deities and then they gave birth to another lunar deity. And so this is telling you something about what Egypt was like a very long time ago, basically. And Thoth, that was one of the, I think one of the important things about Thoth is, is this lunar connection that bef the earliest religion, the earliest type of Egyptian religion was uh, the lunar cult, was the cult of the moon, which uh, I never tire of reminding people about <laughs> things important, actually, it's quite good. Anyway, that's Thoth's book, which is uh, irregular, but um, yeah, it fits really. And he's a moon god. Is it, even though he's the moon god, he, he still has connections to the sun, doesn't he? Because he works for Ra. Well, that's right. Well, I don't. I, this is a that's a tricky issue as well. But well, it's just, he's the, he's Ra at right? midnight. He's the sun at midnight. And what is the sun at midnight but the moon? Hmm. So that's one way of looking at it. This is never completely spelled out. Has to be said. Yes. People are fitting fitting these things together but yeah of course one of his most important functions having been created and been around a long time he he, he plays paid quite a big role in the cult of the sun uh and the seek this and this thing the underworld journey this sequence that the sun god goes through in the underworld which people emulate or whatever uh, <clears throat> in, in which thoth plays these various kind of um, roles of protecting the sun god, but also you, it, it's always difficult to say if they're protecting it or they, they actually are the sun god in a way, but at, in the night, in the underworld. So that, that because Ra in the underworld is a kind of corpse as well, uh, or he's kind of recompiling in some way. And so the, the moon is there, so the moon is, is Ra in the underworld. And there's this whole thing about the two eyes of, uh, you know, the left and right eyes, Thoth and blah, 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 you know. <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's one of his important functions. And that's, that, that's, I don't know if we're going to go on to the, the, the later thing called the Hermetica. Maybe we should, I'll write that down. Because mm -hmm. I just thought, I thought, I was trying to think, oh, God, I always don't ask me to explain the Hermetica. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, that does explain it is that Thoth, I'll write it down, Thoth helps on the night on the night journey. That's what I'm writing down. Because he, he also helps, obviously, because he's meant to be like one of the, the top judges. He helps the gods with their own disputes as well as judging us when we apparently, because he judges or does he just weigh our hearts? I suppose that is a judgment. I don't know if he's the judge, but he's, yeah, yeah, but sometimes he is. He sort of adjudicates, doesn't he? He's like the chief judge then, in some way, in the underworld. He's got a very complicated series of tasks in the underworld uh, <coughs> uh, of, as you say, there's, there's this process. The underworld journey is not, it's not just a kind of story. It's the kind of the, the heart of, the mysteries of Thoth in a way, or it, it's obviously, I say, I can't avoid it from the Dometica. The Dometica is about this sort of made later on at the end, in which they kind of make, make a sort of summary of Egyptian stuff and they, for initiates, for people who want to be initiated into a magical cult of some sort in, uh, in based on an Egyptian mysteries. Uh, and the basic initiation is to follow this underworld journey from dusk to dawn that the sun god makes, in which they are kind of stripped of, their, well, they're dying anyway at sunset, and in which they're stripped of all their kind of faculties and all the rest, and eventually they become in this very weak and in, in a stripped down basis in, in the lowest point of the underworld. And as you say, there's a judgment scene as well. They have to kind of, um, the two things, are, the, the, the underworld, the journey of the sun is also mixed up with this idea of, um, of a judgment of some sort, of which there are kind of two, two tr notable trials <laughs> in, in the Egyptian mythology. There's the, 
the trial that we all have to undertake uh, in the underworld and um, which we have to say that give a list of our virtues of all the good things that we've done and what's good about us and why we are made messed up why our basically in a nutshell why why our existence hasn't been bad for everybody else why we haven't kind of on balance on balance made things crap for us, anybody so it's quite simple you just got to be able to say look i haven't made it worse I might not have made you don't necessarily have to make it better, but you mustn't have said, Well, I actually made it worse, you know. With intention, uh, kind of thing. A good intention. Your heart yeah. is in the right place, exactly. You know, mm. as they would put it, your heart must be in the right place. And it's basic psychology, it's, it, ma it makes complete sense. Uh, so you, you have to list your virtues and say what your life has been like, a little biography of what you believe um, and what what you did with your life, um, uh, what you achieved, and, the fa and that includes things might be your family or the job you did or the things you've written and stuff, and plus all the things you you avoided doing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you mustn't have you know done certain. You mustn't have like like it's not the say say so I haven't kind of um, well. It's, it's, I keep thinking I'm really obsessed with this. Is you. There's actually this, it's possible you might have to say you haven't had sex in a funny way, right? <laughs> but I think it means you haven't had sex in the wrong place, in the sense of in the temple. Well, actually, you're allowed to do it in some temples, but not in, you know, you haven't desecrated anything by doing it and you haven't ruined anybody's crops or blah, blah, blah. So you have to say the things you've avoided and the good things and the bad things about you, and that's. A personal judgment and uh, thought is the one who kind of what looks at the scales and says, though, you know, your your heart is as light as a feather, which is the idea. So it's, which is almost like a yogic thing, you know, that because, you know, when you kind of feel guilty about anything, I don't know about you, I'm kind of like this. If I feel guilty, um, it sort of gets you in the heart, really, you know, yeah. doesn't it? You know, if you feel, feel bad about something, I mean, I, unless you're a psychopath, like probably a psychopath, you wouldn't know, but that's the definition. But, but most people, you know, if they're telling a lie, their heart kind of beats a bit faster or it feels heavier or, or whatever. So, and, and this is obviously human nature. So they kind of thought, if, but if you feel okay about things, uh, that, you know, basically I, you don't beat yourself up and, you, you, then your heart does feel sort of light, doesn't it? it? It just feels okay, you know. It feels balanced and it's beating away and you're happy. And so that it's it's obviously about that idea. So that's that one judgment. Uh, and then there's the other famous judgment is eventually uh, I don't know if it related the, the Horus and Set. They kind of row and argue for about throughout the entire year it's like a cycle of the year and eventually all the other gods sort of decide you better have a trial a tribunal then and make one we decide once and for all who's who's uh, the good guy and who's the bad guy sort of you know um, and and that's a famous trial and I think uh, Thoth takes a role in that as well as a sort of judge uh, making a decision, various versions of the solutions that are put to stop these gods fighting each other. So yeah, no, Thoth is, is incredibly important in uh, all these different things, I would have thought. He can, Thoth's um, said to keep a record of everybody's actions as well, but as you were saying, he's, he's taking all the notes down. But I remember there's a story about how he created writing, and Ra wasn't that pleased with him for doing that, because... Uh, he said people will stop using their minds and their memories because they'd be so used to writing things down, they won't have to remember things anymore because they just go and look it up. And it's quite weird because I, I like writing, I like reading, but I do also see Ra's point of view. <laughs> do you? <laughs> I don't know. I, I say in the ancient world, people are supposed to use their memory more. Hmm. But when they did start using writing, they kind of got to know more. So uh, I think this, the phrase is, I think it's actually the god Ptah that invents the, uh, 
the hieroglyphs and uh, Thoth writes them down and creates the, um, the alphabet. Well, because the hieroglyphs, there's a, there's a, there are about, um, oh, I think there's at least 600 of them. There's loads of them. Uh, there's 600 major ones, maybe even more, all these little pictures. Uh, and some of them are very, very similar. Uh, they sound, they sound the same. So you kind of think it's a, it's a bit cumbersome, right, to have an alphabet that's six hundred characters long. Uh, so apparently, Thoth. One of the things Thoth did was uh, reduce it to about thirty usable characters that, that pretty much covered everything. Um, because obviously, if you're a scribe, and scribes and bureaucrats are very important. Scribes are more important than priests in a way. Uh, then having a sort of simplified version of, uh, of the alphabet, rather than having to work out all these beautiful but very elaborate characters, uh, it would make your life a lot easier and quicker. And that's why Thoth is very connected. He's the patron of scribes uh, of one sort or another. They kind of have a prayer, I think, that they say to him. And they may even have been branded with his or tattooed with his image, I'm not sure. Um, so that's why it's associated with, with writing. But also, if you think about it, this idea of you've got the main alphabet <coughs> of 600 char characters, or, and then you've got a simplified version of about 30 characters, which is called the soul of the alphabet. So th stuff gives you the soul of the alphabet and that so is um, you can see how that would fit with the idea of that he knows the mysteries you know it's it's like uh, the vowels in some other alphabets are, are also called the soul of the alphabet they're, they're hidden they're not exactly hidden but there's a sort of essence of it that's hidden in this great mass of stuff thought devises this essential thing so that's why he's really associated with, um, as I say, scribes, people who write, and therefore with magic, and why he's a very, very important god. All these different things going together, the moon as well, of course, mm -hmm. his connection with the underworld, uh, his connection with the calendar, uh, and writing makes him primarily the, the, a very important god of magic. Uh, which is how we could probably know him a, a, a lot as the, as the god of magic. And in fact, anything that Thoth says in the text or just says is by definition a magical spell. That's, that's the primary source of magic within uh, Egyptian culture is just anything that Thoth says. Uh, you know, it just can just everything he does because he's the sort of personification of magic. Not the only one, but the most important one. And I guess that's why it became so important to us in uh, in the Western uh, magical tradition. I mean, it's funny that Crowley connected with Alistair Crowley. That he he had his. I don't know if he's the one who came up with this idea of calling his tarot deck the Book of Thoth, uh, because uh, the book is, which is it's like a collection of hieroglyphs, isn't it? In a way. You've got sort of whatever it is, 22 major pictures, yeah. or 78, 78 or, all together. All, they're all, they're, they're, they're exactly our hieroglyphs. That's what a hieroglyph is. It's a, it's a picture. Uh, and, it's, and the idea was this is very much what magicians use to communicate with us. So, yeah, no, it's a kind of quite an interesting insight that he called it the Book of Thoth. I'm sure he's not the first one who did that, that because it... It's the, the ultimate magical book. Book of Thoth is the ultimate magical book uh, for, I suppose, now, right? We would say that. But in Egypt itself, the Book of Thoth was the ultimate magical book as well. It was weird. <laughs> but that was, I don't think that was a, what do you say? No, it could have been a, a, like a set of tarot cards in a way. Or, or hieroglyphs, you know, it could easily have been that, but it's usually thought to be this great book of, of magical spells, and there's a fantastic load of stories connected with that as well. 
But you have to kind of, when you look at a hieroglyph, you have to decipher it, don't you? Like when we look at tarot deck cards, we're supposed to decipher and meditate on them so their true meaning comes through. So maybe I would see it as a link like that. Absolutely. I think that's completely one of the connections. I know people kind of don't, they, we went through a phase of saying, oh, the tarot doesn't have any connection with Egypt. But then all these people keep discovering that it does. <laughs> And funny enough, the moon card, the moon card in the tarot, they've dis they found this uh, amulet now in, e in Egypt, magical amulet, which is exactly the image of the that we have in the, in the tarot trump uh, of the moon of this kind of uh, whatever it is Scorpio type image, walking between two towers and the moon and all the rest, and this is an amulet. Uh, and there's loads of samples of that, and that is from Egypt. So I, I don't think we should struggle anymore with that. I think it, it, it just it, it, it clearly is. And yeah, yeah that's, uh, I think you're right. It's um, I think the Egyptians had the, the, that's why we find their culture so special, really, the, this idea of, of, Im, of the image magic, of image magic, which is encapsulated in the, in the hieroglyphs and the alphabet which are themselves a magical creation. They're probably created for the act of magic in the first place. Uh, and they are magical objects. And as you say, they're pictures, they're direct pictures of things that you can meditate upon and you can look at. And they, they, I, I, I always think they're like this thing they call the uh, alphabet of desire. You know, it's almost they used to have an exercise. I don't know if you did this with this Austin Spear. You have to kind of, um, I don't know, you have to think of all the things that you might possibly want in your life, you know, you know, uh, food and stuff like that, and being angry, you might want to be angry or want to be happy or something, all these different things that you want to represent, and then you, you develop a kind of your own little personal pictogram. To represent that, so that whenever you want to call up your, I think Austin Spare maybe you say you want to call up his anger, he'd have a picture of a lion or something like that, or, or maybe the the two the primary ones that are kind of related to hieroglyphs are the the hand, the sort of just the the hand, you know, which is extremely ancient hieroglyph, you know, it's not just Egyptian, it occurs in all these rock arts and everything. It's obviously people say, yeah, that's. That's just that, that it, it just you know what they mean, right? <laughs> you see, that's a human being. You can say straight away that that means a human being, uh, and then you can sort of look at all the bits of it and everything. That the eye, the eye is another very important, obvious symbol that people developed, the, uh, and all sorts of other things. The moon, of course. Books, that, uh, of course, I, I see everywhere. The foot. Books, you say? The foot. Your foot. The foot. The yeah. foot is yeah, that's a good one. Because yeah. yeah, you see a foot, and uh, well, the two you can it has this sense of movement. So you know, I like it. There's, there's this bowl. There's this pre-dynastic bowl that they used to give people medicine in, and it's a little bowl, and it's got two little like Terry Pratchett, maybe not two, maybe four. I don't know, Terry Pratchett like feet. On the bottom of it in this ceramic, you know, it's really, really nice. Like the luggage. They used, put, they used to put medicine in there. So this is your medicine. And I suppose the feet are sort of like get to work type thing. You know, it's gonna get to work. It's yes. gonna move, you know, and gonna get get going and, and make you better. So it's very direct. I think it, <laughs> obviously it's so long ago and it's been kind of uh, hard for people to kind of work it out, but but the basic principles, I think we can understand really. I, I think probably the Egyptian, apparently a lot of people, they, they did relate more to pictures anyway than they did when they started turning this stuff into kind of quite cursive script and stuff like that. A lot, a lot of people, strictly speaking, a lot of people couldn't really read. So sometimes the papyri that they had for to help them in the, this underworld journey were just there wasn't any attempt at text really it was just pictures you're gonna see that and you're gonna see that you're gonna see thoth probably you're gonna see the sun at midnight 
uh, you're gonna, uh, these are maybe six different things you're gonna see and you've gotta be prepared for it and they're gonna be this horrible sneaky thing or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the snakes are coming through the beast. <laughs> they also say that um, when we look at pictures, we're looking at, I always get which one's which, one half of the brain, and wording's the other half of the brain. So maybe in ancient Egypt, they were more, which I think it's right brained when you're looking at pictures. I might have that round the wrong way. Maybe they were more that kind of thinking. Yeah, I think you're right. It's the right brain, it's the mm. more visual bit. Because there's that book, an excellent book called Drawing on the Right Side of Your Brain, uh, which is actually teaching you how to draw, right? But taking account of this fact of the supposed split between the different sorts of the brain and how do you kind of get it to work. Uh, and yeah, no, I think, well, that, that is, magic is essentially is about the manipulation of images uh, one way or another. So they're a very, very visual culture. Everything they make is incredibly beautiful, really. Well, no, I mean, they can make some kitsch. They're capable of doing the kitsch as well. Uh, there are some things, old stuff, that does look a bit, you know, a bit tacky, it has to be said. Uh, but mostly the aesthetic is amazing. You know, there, there's, and that's pretty much what, uh, magic means is that the word the word for magic hekka is is about the manipulation of images, and of course it's the thing that got them into the most trouble um, in later times. Or that some other cultures when they were maybe yeah when when they sort of started banning the images and everything. I mean I think it like in the Ten Commandments it says make no graven image, which is like they've just got out of Egypt and. Um, so they must have had this on their mind, you know, God, let's not do all those, that image stuff. I think probably they said that because they know that Egyptians are so um, adept at constructing these images uh, that if you do too many images, they know they're going to come to life. Yeah, they're, they're mad, right. they're, they will give the, a gateway to the Egyptians who are they're trying to escape. It'll give them, you, it'll be like having a mirror or whatever it is around you when you're not supposed to, or having the images around. It'll give them a, because it's so skilled at this, a gateway to get at them. So they'll probably say, don't make any images for the next kind of little while while they're escaping because you know, they'll know where we are. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's it's obviously that uh, people looked at it. <laughs> and funny enough, in the later times, so all these, so all these ideas about Thoth and everything like that, um, the, the wisdom and his teaching, they all get kind of boiled down into this, this, this book, you know, the, the Hermetica. Uh, and her, it's named after Hermes, which is the, uh, just another name of Thoth, really. It's the Greek it's version, the, isn't it? It's the Greek, it's the, well, it's the, they call it, it's a Greek version, the uh, name of uh, Thoth, but the actual text is all from Egypt. Mm. Uh, all the, most of the material, obviously there's a lot of Greek input, but it's written in Egypt, and it's a sort of summary, really, of the whole doctrine of uh, Egyptian culture, all the better, the, what they'd learned, their wisdom at, the, at, that, po at that point, but when they know the, cult, the Egyptian culture is a, is coming to an end and they're discussing that, you know, it's all coming to an end really. So they put it in there, but it's funny in the, so the Hermetica is a sort of theory, is the theory and it's supposed to be spoken by someone who's called Hermes Trismegistos, quite a thrice great Hermes. So it's a, a direct link, um, although, for a long time, people thought it was the actual god Thoth. Uh, and, uh, it was written by someone, you know, in the very distant past, but they worked out that that wasn't true, that it's, it's written at the end of Egypt, really, when they're summarized. But it's mainly about philosophy. Uh, and there's, there's not a lot of magic within it. But um, the only magic... Um, the, re the reason that the magic, there's not so much magic in it is because lots of people after it in the Christian world and the Islamic world 
took the magic out, right? And that's the way they didn't like that so much. So, they, but they quite liked the philosophy. But they left a couple of bits of magic in, and um, the one bit of magic that they couldn't get rid of was this image magic, was the making of statues. Uh, you know, the, this this is the pride. This is the Egyptian art, the making of the magical statue, in a sense of an image that would. Um, come to life or could be given life in some way. This is probably the most central magical technique from, from even now, I suppose, or one way or another in some form, simplified form. And yeah, that's the one bit. So in, even in the Hermetica, which is against the book, really, it kind of persists, you know, this image stuff. And, you know, words are sort of related to that, really, I'd say. The words are images as well, as, as you said, uh, one way or another, they're an extension of that. All images are magic, but the uh, words themselves are also image magic, one way or another. And, you know, they do a lot of uh, magic with just with uh, hieroglyphs themselves. I'm not just looking at them, but you can sort of manipulate them. You know, like sort of... You, well, you can make sigils out of it. Of course, mm. that's the other thing. You can make strange little signs. You can make them, you can cut them in half. We uh, should kind of do things. Anyway, you see why the early years were like, so best not take the risk, really. <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop this for a bit. Because a lot of people yeah. were, were in trying to, well, were invoking the gods into their relevant statues. When you would invoke, you know, you had your, Foth statue or your Isis statue, and you'd invoke Foth or Isis into their various statues so that you could communicate with them. But they weren't there all yeah. the time. Once you'd finished with whatever you was doing, they would then go again. You think they'd go again? Yeah, I think they'd go back <laughs> to where they came from. <laughs> do you think they get trapped in there then? <laughs> well, what do you think when you go to the when you go to say the Cairo Museum? or a good museum, and you see some of the best Egyptian images, they still uh, got a certain amount of life in them. Absolutely, yes. Uh, thought, you know, they're still kind of sentient in a way. So whether the magic really ever goes completely away, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I suppose you see the other thing, the mummification process is like making a statue as well. So, you're making a magical object of some sort. But yeah, no, I mean, obviously you're right. Sometimes they they did it in substances. They did this thing called the wax image spell. So they made a kind of um, uh, an image of a person out of usually out of wax if they could, if they could get it. <clears throat> and they do things to it, usually, usually you know, sticking needles in it or uh, whatever talking to it i suppose uh and then at the end of the ritual they would uh, destroy it um and i suppose you would say from that that they did it in wax because wax when you burn it completely disappears so if there's anything left <laughs> you can assume from that that they have to um, the power is still there you know one way or another Oh, I see, you can see that, I don't know, I know I'm going off slightly a tangent, but it's sort of interesting that, that the later people, they also, the, Cop the Coptic Christians, they're famous for the modifications they make to Egyptian temples. Uh, you know, do you think they just all whitewash over everything uh, or just chisel it off? But they don't. They, 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 in order to nullify the magic of an image, you have to um, like scratch it. You out. just take the active bits off. You take the feet <laughs> off, or you take the hands off, or you take the face off, and you can leave all the rest. Which is, I, I find this. I know it's a bit of a shame. Obviously, you see these temples yeah. that are completely, but it's also fascinating, right? That they kind of that's how they view these objects that they have to be very carefully dismantled. You can't, you can't do it in some random way. You have to know what you're doing, you know, uh, to, to take a, a statue apart, a magical statue, you know, using a, you have to know all the skills, really. 
uh, and it can easily backfire on you. <laughs> I was about to say, cause maybe if you don't do it properly, yeah, I was going to say it'll backfire on you or it could still come and get you or, you know, seek its vengeance. Because I think they did this to, I know they do it to various gods and goddesses, but the, um, they also did it to pharaohs. I was quite disappointed at how many of, I hope I say this right, Hatshepsut's stuff yeah. had, been, had her face scratched out. And I was like, well, I've come to see you and most of it's gone because it was scratched right. out because of that. By who kind of? Uh, I think it was the her relative king after her. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> he really hated her. <laughs> you know. Well, that's but that's, but that's uh, yeah. There's that's magic. Yeah. There, there's uh, the Egyptian culture is kind of very earthy. You know. So even though she's kind of an incredible character, she obviously got on his nerves. <laughs> <laughs> because he wanted to run the show, didn't he? You know, mm. and she wouldn't retire. Uh, and it, so it's a very human thing, right? I mean, see, that is again connected with a, trying to make sense of this myth of Set as well. That, that he does this thing, you know, the, the whole business about him murdering Osiris and everything. It's, it's true, in these, but when you look at the actual lives of the pharaohs, they're doing that sort of thing to each other anyway, because maybe that's the way it is when you're talking about such a lot of power mm. uh, in families, and even if it is your mother-in-law or your mother or whatever, see, so you, you, you want her to go. You want your turn or your brother or whatever. Maybe that's part of the personality you need when you to, in order to kind of do that sort of job anyway. You need to be an egomaniac. Or just be, it's kill or be killed, baby. If you don't sort of stick up for yourself, then he would never have got a go. But yeah, I know he can. It's, it's most of the beautiful things and everything have been kind of walled them up, didn't he? <laughs> the her obelisk and everything so yeah it's always still there but it's completely covered in masonry so you can't even see it you know it's you interesting that. you said what you've just said because it links to a, i actually had a friend i was telling him i'm going to do a show with you about Foth, and he went oh i've always been intrigued by the image of Foth as a baboon and then you're just saying about how you know you want to go you know how they have to sometimes do egotistical bad things but the baboon's version of Foth, i believe isn't that the uh you know, if he has to go and do a, a bad telling off or do something a bit, uh, I don't know, he, don't really hear of him doing very many naughty things, but isn't it like his alternative ego when Pops with Baboon? I don't know about that, As you said, but it's a good thing to remind us. There's the two major avatars of uh, the god Thoth, one of which is the sacred ibis, uh, and that, that probably the oldest one, and the other one is the baboon, which is... Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's a, if one is worse than, than the other or, or sort of lower than the other. They both seem to kind of crop up about the same amount of times in the, yeah. in the kind of important imagery. So I think they're both quite important. Uh, and maybe there's something, there'll obviously be something about the baboon that is associated. There's this idea that they're, they're supposed to worship the sun or yeah, they're they the first them. animals that come out every morning to see the sunrise, apparently. That's yeah, why. so it could yeah. be that. Oh. I think the thing about Thoth, apparently Thoth as, as an ibis is, um, you see, bird, bird or, uh, birds and bird oracles, they're not always good omens. Uh, a, a lot of these, you know, as you know, people talk about bird flu and, you know, bird spreading diseases across the globe and everything like that. So, and birds that, booing on your car. With what? Birds booing on your car. But, but yeah, <laughs> birds pooing on your car. All these sort of stuff. So birds and these sort of periodical appearances because they migrate, is migrating over great distances and, and appearing. And often their appearance coincides with maybe a not the best time of year or maybe a a disease or a plague or something like that. So, and certainly the other great association of birds is with the dead, um, is, which apparently is why, why Thoth is, is there, is in the sense that 
I mean, you know, when when people are being are dying or have been buried as uh, in the ancient world, the the, the n- number of the birds that kind of appeared. Obviously, vultures is one, mm. right? But the, which will appear even if they're not going to get a chance. But I think the other birds appear as well. And I think Isis and Netflix have a bird form, uh, which is associated with funerals. Uh, the the two kites and they it could be something to do with maybe these birds maybe they think there's going to be a party or something you know if there's a funeral and there's going to be some food around or something or they're just curious uh, you know, seagulls or something and it's the same with the ibis the ibis is connected with uh, ancient funeral rites and it might be that it appears a, a, a it was, it was noticed as appearing at funerals for some reason. Maybe people just people saw it, just noticed them. Mm. So it has this long association with funerals. I don't, I don't, it's mysterious to know why that is. But, I mean, they don't really know what the name means. Oh, uh, I did. Just, the, the name Jehuti or Thoth, oh, Jehuti, yeah. you know, usually they mean something as well. Apart from it being represented by an ibis or a baboon, what does the name, name, sometimes a name, you would think the name of a god or a goddess would mean something. Yes. You know, I don't know. I can't, I can't think, you know, you, there's, a, there's an idea that it would, right? It might, it might refer to something like Horus, might, might mean a uh, falcon or something like that. Or it might be the sound that they make. Uh, that's a, another common way that things get their name. Like a, in the Egyptian language, a cat is, I think, in all languages, is, is, a, is a moo or a mew. Or a oh, meow. like a meow, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. That's just, just gives it their name. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's, there's loads of examples of, of, of that, of how animals get their names from the noise that they make. Uh, probably the same with snakes and everything like that. But, but with soft, they don't really know. Why, where that name comes from, it is it's just speculative, really. It's, now, which is always very interesting because it mean, that means it's uh, when something has an uncertain origin, it, it usually means it's very, very old. Uh, when we, people just don't know why it got that name, it's almost like when people came out of the ice age or whatever, when they wanted to refer to something, you know, they go, I don't know. Oh, God. <laughs> no, they just these uh, spontaneous outpourings of sound. Yes. At certain moments, as one does, there are certain sounds that are sort of just natural, you know, like saying, oh, go or whatever, or, ah, you know, screaming or whatever. They're probably the first sort of sounds that people kind of make in certain circumstances. You know, they always make the same sort of sound wherever you are, whether they're crying or, or whatever. And these, sort of very emotive uh, things uh, give rise to the first words. So Thos, his name, God, I don't know where that comes from, it, but, <clears throat> but it's probably one of these very, very ancient, if you were in Hinduism, you say ancient mantras, a seed mantra, one of the first basic sounds of which the universe is made, uh, give rise to these names of these gods and stuff. Anyway, that's just speculation. Your guess is as good as mine, but it's, it's, all, it's all part of the mystery, really, isn't it? And, and you know, Bob is, is very mysterious. He's very mysterious and very important. Very, yes, very, very magical. <laughs> yeah, and we're so in I, his month now. I was going to say, you you know, when his month is, which is like just say well, now, I, July. Well, yeah, I mean, in my mad scheme of things. Uh, we said, you know, like if you're going to try and reconstruct the Egyptian calendar, <clears throat> then you're going to have to make some sort of presuppositions, right? You're going to have to choose a time in which you're going to start to have it. You're going to have it right at the end of uh, in the Roman period or whatever. You're going to have to make all sorts of assumptions. So this is this was my kind of piece of detective work that the first month of the year. Uh, in the Egyptian calendar is called Thoth. Uh, it's named after him. 
So it's so each of the months has a different god or goddess associated with them. The Thoth is associated with the first month of the year. That's one possibility. Which um, is the Egyptian year, because the Egyptian year starts in the summer, doesn't it? Well, again, it just depends when you look at it. But one way of looking at it is, is to say the Egyptian year starts around, depending where you are in Egypt, round about the summer solstice, one way or another. Uh, although it's slipped around a bit and everything like that, but one version of it will start as a summer solstice. So it's about now. But the other thing is, this is in a lunar calendar. So we're, obviously the Egyptian calendar that's more famous is not a lunar calendar. It's more like our calendar. It's a, a what do you call it? A solar. solar. Yeah. And, yeah. And it kind of moves. It, it doesn't really fit with the seasons that well. Um, but, but whatever. So, but if you go back to a true lunar calendar, which they did, obviously the period in which Thoth started out, as we say, they were, they're not the only lunar gods, Horus, Set, um, Thoth, there's also Khonsu, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, there's a whole pantheon of lunar deities. It's a lunar world. Um, if you go back to that time and, and assume, as most people do, there's lunar calendar, then also... Uh, a lunar calendar has to have an extra month put into it every three years to keep it in sync with the seasons. Otherwise, it because of the lunar weather. So it could be that this extra month is called Thoth as well. That's a possibility. That occurs in old records. So one way or another, we're in the Thoth month. And it's just past the full moon, you reminded me. And this is very, very special. But he has a special festival which is uh on the 18th day of the lunar month so that's a couple of days after the full moon so saturday or sunday i think i have a look i was gonna and say this, this weekend week, yes this weekend so this weekend if you <laughs> want to think about it what you're supposed to do is going to be tricky what they what the egyptians used to do is go and visit their tombs uh, of their relatives, not necessarily all the kings, all their family tombs or, or ancestral tombs, or they think about their relatives in one way or another. And they often they tidy up and put new material in because there was a room that they could go in. They couldn't go into the tomb itself, probably, but the antechamber, they'd have furniture in it, they'd tidy it all up, put some more food in, and do some uh, little rituals for the for their ancestors, this ancestor worship. So that's a that's a very Thothian, and that's because Thoth has this connection with the uh, with the dead in lots of different ways, and his most original way with the ancestors and the funeral rites and the tomb and stuff. And that's his particular moment this weekend. So yeah, I'm gonna. You've reminded me now. I better think about it. I probably would have remembered. This is the right time to make. Okay. This is the right time to make this little show then. Yeah. Yes, excellent. So people go forth and do the full thing. Forth and <laughs> think about your ancestors, mm. whoever they are, including the very distant ones. And yeah, if you've got a tomb to go and visit, then they would have gone and got, done that. But maybe just think about them and light a candle for them or something. That would be nice. Well, I'm going to bring the show to the end because we've done yeah. an hour. So thank you very much, Mog. And thank you everybody yeah. for watching. Mog, just remind everybody of your YouTube channel because I think you do some great blogs. I love listening to you. Well, I think it, the channel is called Morgan Films. But I've got a thing on there now, a new thing called the uh, Egyptian Magic Podcast. Maybe I should change the name of the channel to that. I'm not sure. But anyway, if you look for it, Egyptian Magic Podcast, I put the link last time, but I'll do it again yeah. to this one we as well. You should find it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so thank you very much, Mog. This has been brilliant. Yeah. I love Fog. A pleasure. A pleasure. And hope you will do some more soon. So thank yeah. you, everybody, for listening. And, and may Thoth the gods is high, as I say. Yes, uh, and, uh, Thoth is high. <laughs> <laughs> Traditional, apparently. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the show and see you all next time.